Okay, why don't you all take your seats? Come and take your seats. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Ann Harrison. I'm the Dean of the Haas School of Business. Welcome to today's Dean Speaker Series. It is co-sponsored with the Center for Social Sector Leadership, otherwise known as SIZZLE. Um, Nora here, who runs it, is, is uh, sitting right here. I am absolutely thrilled to introduce our guest today, Blake Mykoski. Um, Blake's story is a really powerful one. He was on a trip in Argentina in 2006, and while he was there, he saw many children who had no shoes, and he was deeply affected by how difficult their lives was, were. And so he decided to create Tom's Shoes. Um, and in doing so, he created the one-for-one -one business model. And that's a model where a customer, by buying a product, helps someone else in need every time they buy. And that was a complete revolution in the way to do for-profit business. Amazingly, over its lifetime, Tom's has provided over 96 million pairs of shoes for children around the world. Um, since then, Tom's expanded into other areas of vital needs, for example, eyewear and safe water. Um, now, Blake didn't stop there. He published a book, Start Something That Matters. And every time that book sells one copy, he donates a child's book to a child. Um, so that's really amazing. His current ventures include co-founding a wellness program, Made For, and his philanthropic endeavors include working in the area of legalizing psychedelics. Hopefully we'll hear a little bit about that today too. Um, we're incredibly fortunate today to have such a trailblazer here working in the area of socially responsible business, an area that Haas excels in and that we're passionate about. Um, Blake, our students have so much to learn from you. I just want to thank you once again for coming to speak today uh, to give your insights to our community. Um, so I just, uh, some quick housekeeping. When you sat down, you might have noticed a note card on your seat. Um, if you, a question occurs to you, write down the question while you're listening to the Q&A, and then you can hand it um, to our, um, our assistants here, my colleagues. They'll be collecting them, and then there'll be time starting about 1.10 for some Q&A. Um, so now I'm going to turn over the session today to two students who will be doing the Q&A. Eli, Eli Bressler and Yvonne Mondragon, and they will moderate today's discussion. Take it away. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. So, Blake, thank you for being here. Um, as we've mentioned before, here at Haas, we care a lot about social impact and entrepreneurship, so everybody here is very excited to hear from you. Um, to start us off, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey starting Tom's? Kind of from your perspective, how, what influenced the one for one model and how that helped drive the success of Tom's? Okay, great. Well, Tom started in Argentina, and there's kind of a funny backstory of how I got there. Um, how many people have seen the reality TV show, The Amazing Race? Oh, a lot of people. Okay. Did anyone see it 20 years ago when I was on it? <laughs> Two people, yes. Um, so my sister and I were on this TV show, Amazing Race, and for those who haven't seen it, you're racing around the world for 30 days, and there's a million dollar prize at the end. And interestingly enough, the last leg of the race was here in San Francisco. And uh, unfortunately, um, at a very critical moment, my sister said, you know, we're almost there to win the million dollars. Let's stop and ask for directions to make sure we know where we're going. And as a, such a cliche, as a man, I said, no, I know exactly where I'm going. We don't need to stop and ask. And next thing I know, we were lost. And we lost the million dollars by four minutes. And uh, after we lost the million dollars by four minutes, about a month later, I got a text message from my sister. And it was this like random string of numbers. 
And I thought, that's weird. And I thought, well, maybe she, you know, kind of butt dialed me or something. And, and that's what came through on the text. So I didn't respond or anything. And then the next month, I got another text message. And it's a different random string of numbers. And so I called her and I said, Paige, what's with these text messages? And she goes, that's the interest you owe me on my half million dollars. <laughs> And so that was a great experience. But what the Amazing Race did was it really took me to all these countries I had never been to. Uh, and Argentina was one of them. And so I decided that I wanted to go back to a lot of the countries. And so in January of 2006, I took a trip to Argentina. I was there for about a month. And um, I experienced a bunch of different things. And one of the things that I experienced was, and it was the first time that I really seen this was just, you know, really intense poverty. Uh, just outside of Buenos Aires, I saw, you know, many kids in the street and not wearing shoes and sniffing glue and, and, and just some really horrible things with these children. Uh, and at the same time, um, I noticed that a lot of the young people were wearing these slip-on shoes uh, called alpregatas. And, you know, I grew up wearing Converse and Vans and kind of these thick, bulkier, you know, slip-ons. But these were like, you know, really... Um, and different. And so I asked my friend at the time about these shoes, and he said, yeah, you know, the farmers wear them, the polo players wear them, you know, and I thought they were really interesting. Uh, in a very serendipitous way, I met a woman that was running a nonprofit, and they were specifically helping kids get shoes for school. Um, the shoes was part of the uniform, and so many of these kids that I saw in the streets, the reason they were in the streets and not in school was because their families couldn't afford the uniform, which included a pair of shoes. And so I had this kind of morning ritual where I drink my coffee and write in my journal about the day and, you know, have some of the things I'm thinking about, goals for the day. And when I was sitting on this farm that I was staying at in Argentina, I was writing in my journal and this idea came to me. And the idea was really simple. It was just, you know, what if I took these shoes that I see all these people wearing that I've never seen before and sell them back in Venice, California, where I live. And every time I sell a pair, uh, we give a pair to these kids that desperately need them for, you know, for their school uniform. And um, we'll call it Shoes for Tomorrow. Um, the idea was that if you buy a pair today, we give a pair tomorrow. And most people think my name is Tom. It's not. Um, <laughs> but um, that's where the name Tom's came from was Tomorrow's Shoes. And we wanted to put the whole word Tomorrow's on the tag, but it wouldn't fit. Um, so we shortened it to Tom's, and that's how we got the name. Yeah. That's really incredible, and uh, as someone with two sisters in the crowd right now, I can only imagine that costing us all a million dollars for four <laughs> minutes, you're probably catching grief about that today, so I, I empathize with that. Um, you know, we are on an MBA campus, and so I think one of the things that we're really curious about is the business of Tom's, and the one-for-one -one model signals a lot how you can have a profitable, successful enterprise and also have it do good, do well for the world, right? Yeah. So I think one of the things we're curious about is how you layer in social responsibility and what complexity that adds. You know, what challenges have you faced in maintaining Tom's commitment to social impact while ensuring the company's financial uh, responsibility? What sacrifices do you have to make on both sides of that coin mm. to make sure that both can succeed financially and your social goals? Okay. Um, well, I think it maybe start in answering the question, just thinking about the financial aspects of the Tom's business model, there's really kind of a magic formula uh, that Tom's, you know, kind of created and that other businesses have followed. And it's not necessarily just the one for one model. It's this idea that our giving and our commitment to our impact um, had a greater influence on the customer than any type of marketing we could ever do. And so while, you know, many companies might spend 10, 15, 20% of their margin on marketing, we spent basically zero. Um, and instead, we took that money and we used it to pay for another pair of shoes, which was oftentimes less expensive than the marketing. And so that's why, like, when we, we became extremely profitable, and which was a kind of a surprise to me, because when I started the, we didn't even call it a business, we called it a project. Uh, we started the Tom's Project, we priced the shoes based on how much it costs for us to make them in a guy's garage in Argentina. So you can imagine when the business took off and all of a sudden we were working at big factories, the costs went down so much that our profit went, you know, went up a lot. And so we really had to focus on, to be successful as a business, we actually need to focus on our giving as much as anything else and telling that story of the giving. And I really, I learned that lesson in a, in a really kind of funny way. I was uh, in the JFK airport. We had just started Tom's. Um, and I was probably two, three months in. And 
the only people we really sold toms to was like my parents, their friends, um, you know, um, my neighbors, uh, and I was living in Venice, California. And so I was in New York trying to get new stores, and um, I decided to go for a run right before I had to get to my flight. And so I went to the JFK airport not wearing toms, which was unique for me. At that point, I always wore toms. And so I had my running shoes on. And I go to the American Airlines check-in counter. I'll never forget this. It was kind of one of the most meaningful things in the early days of Tom's for me. And I went to do the kind of electronic check-in. And next to me, there was this woman uh, wearing a red pair of Tom's. And I had never seen a stranger wearing our shoes. I mean, it was so cool. Um, it, was, it was such a cool moment. And so I'm, I'm kind of looking at her, and I'm thinking, gosh, should I say something? And so I decide to, to say, you know, hey, I, I really love these, these shoes you're wearing. You know, what are they? And she says, Tom's, Tom's shoes. And so I'm doing the check-in. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And she literally physically put her hand on me and said, no, you don't understand. This is the most amazing company in the world. <laughs> She goes, when I bought this pair of shoes, they gave a pair to a child in Argentina. And there's this guy who started. I heard he lives on a boat. And, <laughs> and, and she just went on and on. So I, I was feeling bad. And so I, was like, I had to stop her. And I'm like, I'm like excuse me, actually, um, I'm, I'm that guy. I'm Blake. I live on a boat. And I started Tom's. And, and she goes to me. She looks at me like, like deers and, deer in headlights. Like just like She's so like, what? And she goes, why did you cut your hair? <laughs> and I was like, how does she know I cut my hair? And I realized that she wasn't just a customer. She was, a, she was just totally in, invested in this. And she had watched all these videos on YouTube of us giving the shoes away. And so that's how she knew I had cut my hair. But then as I you know, said thanks to her and, and went to my flight and started thinking about that conversation, I realized that you know, th this woman took the time out of her day at an airport to tell a stranger about Tom's. So how many people has she already told about Tom's? I mean, definitely all her friends and family and people on Facebook. And, you know, and so I realized that the effect of just one customer connecting to our giving was going to have a, a, such a magnitude effect on how many shoes we would sell and ultimately give away. And so that's when we really decided that as a business model, we were not necessarily going to be f focused on the things that a traditional business was, but really focused on giving and telling our story. And that's why our model works so well. Yeah, that's awesome to hear, um, to see that something you believe in, others also believe in. And you know, it, it grew into you know, what Tom's is today. Going off of that, a lot, you know, large scale innovation is something that is very hard to do. There's some products out there that we see that we think this large scale is inevitable, right? Um, what are some of the challenges that you experienced uh, with scaling up Tom's and how did you face those challenges? Um, the, well, the biggest challenge was making the dang shoes. Um, I mean, I'd never made shoes before. Um, my Argentine polo playing partner, Alejo, had never made shoes before. And we met this guy who said he could make them in his garage, um, which he could do somewhat sufficiently. Um, so really scaling the production once the business took off was really, really hard. Um, you know, what I found was the key to that was finding people who did know how to make shoes uh, and had done it for companies that really scaled. And so we very early on we were able to attract um, a really senior executive from one of the big shoe companies uh, to come and start working in my apartment with us. I think he was employee number two or three. And the first two were interns off Craigslist. But um, <laughs> But, but, you know, Sean came to us, and I remember it was really cool. I went on a, a factory tour with him in Asia, and we were drinking beers one night, and I said to him, I said, Sean, you know, why did you come to Tom's? You know, because, I mean, we're paying you probably half as much as... Um, as you, uh, as you made at this, you know, I think it was Nike or Converse, I forget where he was at before. And he is you know, very senior in his, in his role. He'd worked in the industry for, I think, 30 years. And I said, you know, because we're paying you probably half or two-thirds what you're paying, and, you know, you're having to do the job of basically five people. Um, and it was so cool. He's told me, he said, and this goes back to the giving being our key differentiator, is he said, you know, because now... Um, you know, our kids think I'm so cool. 
you know, and my daughter thinks it's so amazing that I'm helping kids get shoes. And so I get to, you know, that, that's a big part of why I'm here. And that's also, I realized that, you know, just focusing on our giving and staying authentic to that was, was so important because without Sean, we never would have been able uh, to scale the business. That's really interesting. It feels like people are attracted to it because it's solving two problems. It's putting stylish shoes on people's feet. That's actually a fun problem to solve. It's also putting shoes on the feet of people in need, and that's an even more fun problem to solve. I think when we think about the most successful businesses, the most successful products, like that's what they fundamentally do. They solve problems that people can't solve themselves. Like Velcro allows me to fasten my, fasten my shoes. Advil allows me to re reduce pain, inflammation, all that kind of stuff. How do you go about figuring out what problems people need to solve and how you can solve that problem. And even one step further, if you know how to solve the problem, how do you turn that into a business that can solve it for a lot of people? What does problem solving and filling need look like for you? Okay, so I'm going to tell a story from a different company. Um, so I've started... Uh, I think five or six companies, and, and most of them were before Tom's, uh, and one of them was an online driver's education company. Now, how I got into that business is, is, is uh, you know, really by listening to someone's problem. Um, I was at a barbecue for a television network that I'd also helped start, and, um, and, and my head of programming son was there, and he was 15 years old, and I asked him, you know, what are you doing this summer? And he kind of said, uh, I'm learning to drive. And I was like, huh, that's not the, I mean, I would think that if you're learning to drive, that'd be exciting for a 15 year old. And I said, well, wh why is learning to drive not that exciting? And he said, oh, you know, it's a, I'm in this classroom and it's stinky and it's dark and it's in this like mall. And I got this old lady teacher and I can barely understand what she's saying. And the cars are just crap. And I mean, he was just super negative. And I was thinking, well, this is not good for our safety on our California highways. <laughs> you know, if this is how this engage or disengage this kid is, like we are in a lot of trouble. And so I went home that night, and this is right when um, you know MySpace was out. And there was no Facebook yet, um, and um, some of you probably don't even know what MySpace is. I'm realizing. Um, so, but um, and it was also when they were just starting to do things online that traditionally had been done, you know, in brick and mortar. And so I thought, well, you know, one way to, you know, solve this problem of these classrooms that are really not that inspiring, they're usually in like Sears malls or something, uh, is to see if we could take this class online. And so that, you know, it could be more engaging, more entertaining, they could do it at their own pace, you know. And so that was, you know, one idea. And, and I worked really hard with some legislature to get that changed in um, California so that we could do that. And so that was step one. Uh, and step two was we got to get better cars. Like these cars have got to be more interesting. Now this was right when Toyota came out with the Prius. And so they had this huge desire to get people to know what an electric car even was. And, you know, starting with young people who might be more environmentally inclined was one of the big part of their thing. And so I cold called Toyota down in Torrance and got a meeting and they decided to like give us four cars at like, you know, basically at the cost. But the third thing was the teacher. And I and that was something that was gonna be a little bit harder to do because you know people who were kind of drivers ed teachers were pretty uh, a very specific type. They're usually retired. Um, you know they were usually you know um, you know I mean it just they were it was I, I think everyone can remember the drivers ed teacher unless you went to our school because I'll tell you why ours was special um, and you'd really remember because what we decided was these teenagers were not paying attention to their teachers at all. And so we thought about, okay, how can we get them to pay attention? Now, we were lucky because we lived in Los Angeles. So we had a lot of actors and models. <laughs> and so we went and basically and hired a bunch of Abercrombie and Fitch models and actors that had all this free time. And we knew that teenagers would pay attention to them, and it worked. And so we had them as our driver teachers. And uh, they would post pictures on MySpace of them and their teacher. And, uh, and so we solved all three problems at once. That's beautiful. I, uh, I distinctly remember my driver's ed teacher self brand himself as Tupac Dave, and he was far too old to be trying to educate 15-year-olds about Tupac and not teaching them about driving. So I, I understand not learning anything and also trying to make sure kids actually learn how to drive so it's safe. Um, 
pivoting a little bit, you're mentioning a lot of partnerships. Like you're talking about Toyota, you're talking about these Abercrombie and Fitch models. You've been talking about this person that you met um, who was working at Nike, who came to work for you. And I think partnerships are key. And I know you often talk about collaboration as being key to success. I'm curious, what are the green flags that you look for in individuals, entities, partners, um, of what you think would make them a trustworthy par partner, a good faith partner, someone who you want to do business with, whether it's an individual or an entity? Kind of what's your criteria? What are the green flags? I mean, I think the most important thing in a partnership is, is the partnership going to be seen as something that's authentic, that makes sense? You know, um, the best partnership we ever had was with AT&T. Uh, it was truly one of the, the the biggest turning points in our business, and I would even say in my life, um, because what happened was is I was on uh, CNN doing an interview, and um, I did an interview, and I was they were asking about how many people worked at our company. At this point, there were like 40 of us, uh, and we were selling all over the world, and they were like, how in the world do you run your business when you're in places like Ethiopia giving shoes or Cambodia or Guatemala, and there's only 40 of you, and you're competing against these big shoe companies? And I pulled out my, it was funny, I had a Blackberry back then. Do you guys remember Blackberry? Okay, good. Um, I'm not as old as I think. Um, and so I pulled out my, my Blackberry on the CNN interview and I said, this is how I do it. And I, I basically, I can run the business and do everything from my phone while I'm in Ethiopia. And, um, and, and, and so this ad uh, exec was in the back of a taxi in New York, and they saw this interview on CNN, and they thought, oh, my gosh, if he uses AT&T, this is perfect. And so they called me, and luckily they asked me if I used AT&T, and I said yes, and that was one of the great, you know, lucky moments of my life because they said, we want to do a commercial about you and Tom's and your story, and we don't want to like create something slick, and, and we want to actually go with you on a giving trip to Argentina and just film you and then make a commercial. And so they made this commercial, and it was like lightning in a bottle. They loved it. They tested it. It tested well. They premiered it on the Masters Golf Tournament, which if you know that tournament, they only allow three different commercials for the entire term. And then they played it at the NBA, you know, you know, final, final um, playoff games, everything. They ended up spending $30 million on a commercial to basically tell the Tom story. And, but it was completely authentic because I use AT&T. And so it worked really well for them. Our business grew 500% that year because of that commercial. Um, and so literally, I think, uh, you know, I mean, we went from, you know, I mean, it was just, it was crazy how much it grew. And that was really the beginning of our, our, our mass growth. But that partnership was so important. And the reason it worked, to your question, is because it was completely authentic. Yeah, that's a great partnership story. Um, moving a little bit away from the business side and trans transitioning into leadership, I strongly believe every great venture has a strong leader behind it. You often talk about being a servant leader, one that aims to serve others. You talk openly about your failures and vulnerabilities. Um, how do you think sharing some of those experiences have shaped you into the leader you are today? Mm, thank you. Um... Well, I think when you hear the term servant leader, I think it's a really important term. Um, and it goes back to the fact of, you know, in most businesses, the, your, your employees that are on the front line are serving customers. You know, you hear that phrase. And in order for them to really serve your customers, they need to be served from their managers. And I think that's really the job of a manager or an executive is not just to lead the vision of the business, but to really serve those that are working for them so that they feel empowered to, you know, really serve the customer. Um, I think also, you know, leaders really set the culture. And I think, you know, talking about failures and vulnerabilities, um, you know, you really, I believe, need to set a culture where it's okay to fail. You know, I always say if I'm going to fail, I want to fail fast um, so I don't waste a lot of time and money failing. But I, I, I learn from it and I move on. And so I think it's really important that as a leader that you show that failures are not going to be reprimanded. You know, if anything, they're going to be celebrated because what did we learn from that failure? And I think that's a really important part of leadership. I love hearing that. And I think one other thing we hear a lot of successful entrepreneurs talk about is luck. Mm -hmm. So learn quick from your failures, but also you have to have some luck sometimes. 
you know, some say they create their own luck and that they earned it and they built that luck. And if they didn't work as hard and put themselves in those situations, that luck would have happened. Others say a beautiful opportunity fell in my lap and I got lucky that my idea worked. So I'm curious what you think about luck and how much luck has played into your success. I mean, I'm a lucky guy for sure. Um, so I, um, I, I think I think there is some truth to this idea that you know the harder you work, the luckier you get. Um, but I also think that you know um, sometimes just an idea. You know, I mean, how do we have an idea? You know, start there. Like I'm sitting on a farm in Argentina, and this idea is somewhat downloaded or transmitted to my brain. The thing goes to my journal. The thing goes to starting a business. The thing goes to kind of changing the face of business across the world. Like. I can't take responsibility for that. Like, I have no, I mean, from a spiritual perspective, I don't really understand how that came about, but I feel really lucky that I was the one that got to do it. Um, and so, so I do think that, you know, you can make your own luck and you have to work hard. But I also think that in certain businesses or certain ideas that come and really, you know, have a huge effect on culture, um, that idea was just, it's time was to come. And the person that got to bring it to the world is pretty lucky. So I feel lucky. Yeah, that's great. I think we're all hoping for some a little bit of luck out here to <laughs> go on to our next uh, endeavor. Um, so your ventures have given us shoes, uh, provided safe drinking water, and restored vision of countless individuals at a global scale. Mm. Going forward, where do you think uh, the greatest need will be? And uh, what new business models outside of the one for one model um, have you been excited about or um, you've seen actually work? Well, I, I think if I was an entrepreneur starting out today, I would be spending a lot of time looking at green energy. I think that, you know, um, one of the biggest, you know, problems facing our species right now is the climate. And I think there's going to be so many opportunities. There already have been so many opportunities, so many, you know, fortunes built focusing on, you know, you know how we can live in a more sustainable way. But, you know, it's something that I don't have a lot of uh, experience or expertise in. But I think that's where I would really be focused because I think that there's just going to be, you know, we, we have, I mean, technology and innovation is our only way out. And so when there's a necessity, there's usually great opportunities for entrepreneurship. I think half of my classmates here who are going into green energy and climate tech just got really excited. So thank you for that. The future is bright, my friends. Um, I, I do also want to ask about another interest that you have and something that you've pledged time and resources towards, which is the legalization of psychedelics. And I just want to know, like, what inspired you to get involved with that? And where do you think the opportunity is for that to succeed? Or just any general thoughts about that space, which is kind of new and upcoming? Sure. So I, I think... Um I mean, I'm, I'm really excited about this. I feel like this is really at the beginning of a new frontier in how we help address so many mental health challenges. Um, you know, I've struggled myself with depression. Um, I know many people that have, and I know many people that have taken the traditional route of, of pharmaceuticals and talk therapy and, and have not had success. Um, I had the opportunity, gosh, it was six, seven years ago, uh, a friend of mine famous podcaster, Tim Ferriss, many of you probably know, um, called me and, and had known that I had worked with psychedelics myself and had found them, you know, very beneficial. Um, and, and we had shared that with each other and in private. And, um, and he said, you know, the, the John Hopkins is thinking about creating the first ever center for psychedelic research in the country. And they're looking for a few philanthropists, um, to kind of step up and help, you know, endow this. And at that point, you know, most of my uh, giving had been through Tom's and then also um, a supporter of, of some of these nonprofits like Charity Water that I'm a big fan of. And so this was a kind of a, you know, giving to a university and, and helping endow a department for psychedelic research. This was really kind of outside of my scope. But, you know, I realized and Tim really helped me understand and see that there was going to be very few opportunities as a philanthropist to have their dollars be so leveraged. Because if, if this worked and, and John Hopkins could show, you know, the effects of psilocybin or MDMA or, you know, LSD on different mental health challenges, that this could be the beginning of of legalization and, and really our society accepting that these are not necessarily drugs, but they're actually medicines. And, um, 
And so I made that donation, and it was the largest donation that I had made uh, to date at that time. And then about two years later, uh, there's an organization called MAPS uh, that has been working really hard to um, put MDMA through the FDA um, for mainly for helping with PTSD. And they were at a critical place in their FDA um, kind of path, and they needed to raise, I think, ten million bucks. And so. Interesting enough, Tim Ferriss called me again, and uh, and 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 Tim and a guy named Joe Green were putting together this this round and trying to raise this for the nonprofit. And they explained the benefit, especially to many of our veterans. Um, you know, the statistic that haunts me every day when we think about our veteran community is that 17 veterans a day commit suicide. I mean, that's more people are dying of suicide than dying in combat now. And that, to me, is just inexcusable. And so seeing how MDMA can have an effect on that um, and helping with the PTSD and depression that many of them experience was, you know, really an amazing opportunity for me. And so I made that investment. Um, and then I just kind of sat back and watched these two for about four or five years. And then a couple years ago, I decided to get more engaged and more involved. Um, I made an a investment here in the, in the Berkeley Center for Psychedelic Science. Uh, I continued to help John Hopkins. I've worked with the VA now on um, some projects there. Um, and, and what I'm finding is, is, you know, I like things to happen fast. Uh, I think as an entrepreneur, that's kind of one of our characteristics. This is going to be a long process. I mean, this is something that I probably commit the rest of my life to because that's how long it's going to take for things to really become legal, to have, you know, regulated access. We're working on a bill through the legislature in California right now um, to create um, regulated access for PTSD, for MDMA and psilocybin. Um, you know, that'll go to the governor's desk, you know, next year around September. So there's a chance that it, it gets passed, um, which will then really, you know, change the landscape across the country. But this, this to me is the most exciting, you know, kind of science advancement that we could have that could have the biggest impact on what really is a health epidemic in our country um, with mental health issues. So I feel really, really lucky. It's kind of like when Tom's idea came to me and I got to be part of a change in the way that business is done. You know, I feel really lucky that now I get to be a part of a way that hopefully we help, you know, millions, if not billions of people around the world uh, with mental health issues. Thank you so much. Uh, I do want to thank you for all that. I'm, I'm very passionate about this space. Personally, do I wish I had my own Tim Ferriss? Absolutely. But otherwise, uh, just interfacing with well, Be careful. People. Tim Ferriss has been very expensive for me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. Um, but no, it's a, it's a huge need. Um, and I think I could ask about 200 follow-up questions about that. But I want to be conscious of time. We have a lot of questions here from the audience. So the last question we want to ask you is, you know, you're sitting in front of a room of aspiring leaders, entrepreneurs, people who are going through their MBA or teaching at this program so that they can make a real difference. And so just for the aspiring leaders in the room, whatever capacity that is, do you have any last words of advice, parting pieces of wisdom just for us aspiring leaders? Oh, man, that's always the hardest question because, like, do I really want to sit here and give you advice? I mean, I'm not that much older than most of you guys in the room. Um, I mean... I think I, we were talking about this back there. And so I would say if, if you have entrepreneurial desires, um, then this is a, advice that I think is particularly for you. Uh, and that is that I really had this kind of belief that, you know, to, to found a successful company, it, it really has to come from a passion, from a, from a need, from something that you've seen in the world that you're frustrated with or you don't agree with or there's a product you wish you had but you can't buy. Um, I, I really believe that that's where the great businesses come from. I think it's very dangerous to you know come, get your MBA, learn about entrepreneurship and be like, okay, I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm just going to go start a business without the passion behind it, you know, just because you think you're going to make money. I've seen most of those businesses fail, to be honest. And so if you make making money the reason you're getting into entrepreneurship, I think it's dangerous. I think if you make the change you want to make or the product you want to create or the service you want to provide because you deeply care about it, the reason you're becoming an entrepreneurship, then the money will follow. And, and so that's... Um, that is what I would say is, you know, kind of one of the main pieces of advice I have for entrepreneurs. The second piece of advice, I'm going to give two now, I just realized there's another one, um, is, 
you, you, this is and this is going to be super contrary to this group. I can tell already because um, you're spending so much money to get your MBA here. Um, and so as soon as you graduate, um, as soon as you graduate, you're going to have a ton of pressure yourself, your student loans, your parents perhaps, uh, to go out and get a job that will pay the most amount of money for a job that you can get. And that makes sense, you know, initially. Um, and, but, but, but the truth is, is no matter how much money you make working at a bank or a consulting firm or whatever, um, it's not going to actually have that big of impact on how much money you make in your life. And I'm not saying making money is the only reason that we work, but it is one of the reasons. And, and so what I tell people is like, instead of going out and just chasing the biggest paycheck right away, think about what you're most passionate about and invest your time at least for a few years in that without the pressure to pay those loans back right away or to make as much money as possible. Because what usually happens is if you follow your passion and you do something that you're really deeply interested in versus just trying to make money, you become really good at it. And when you become really good at anything, usually you make money at it. And so that I know is probably not going to, it's falling on some deaf ears, but that's fine. Um, and you, know, you think I'm naive and idealistic, and it's easy for me to say because I've already made money. Um, but 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 I really have seen. I've, I've given that advice uh, to undergrads and and MBAs over you know probably you know 15 years of speaking now. And I and I've had people come up to me you know or write me emails or letters years later and say that really made an impact because they end up getting into something that they deeply cared about. And they got really great at it, and then they made the money. So there you go. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Blake. Turn it over to Nora. So first I want to thank Blake for starting off with the loss. We don't do that very much in business school. And I want to really acknowledge um, Eli and Yvonne who came up with the questions and posed them so well, don't you think? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So my name's Nora Silver. I'm a faculty director for the Center for Social Sector Leadership. We call CISL, and I'm an adjunct professor here, and Anne was kind enough to share this Dean's Speaker Series with us. Before we open it up for your questions, which I do have here, thank you very much, um, I have a few for you. How many of you are Berkeley or Haas students? Okay. How many of you came here in order to make a difference or create social impact at Berkeley or Haas? How many of you came here for that? Okay, about half. Do we have any alumni here? Welcome back. <laughs> Do we have any friends and family of Blake or of Sissel? Yay, Emma, uh, Ella, sorry. Okay, so I wanna take a minute with the students in particular, whatever you came here for. If you are curious about the kind of innovation that Blake made, or the kind of career path that he took, I want you to know, do you know, that you can explore it through CISL? And I want to point out a couple of things. Gloria, would you stand up? Gloria is right now teaching a course called Reinventing Capitalism for a Sustainable, Humane, and Equitable World. It's offered this spring. It will be offered next spring as well. Stay there. <laughs> In the fall, Gloria taught and will teach, again, Business Models for Social Impact. She teaches that with Kristen Gruce Richmond. Both of them are serial social entrepreneurs who can introduce you to different models, such as that Blake described and describes in his book. Thank you, Gloria. <laughs> For those of you who want to found something with social impact, we do have an impact startup disco. It's an intensive week long with Jorge Calderon that will walk you through those initial kind of scary steps. And lastly, I'm going to be teaching in the fall a course on social movements. I'm exploring teaching that if that's what you're interested in. We have a lot of experiential programs and one I want to point out to you because it's coming up. If any of you are interested in trying, exploring a social impact summer internship, we have a program that will supplement your salaries if that's what you're worried about. So look for the HIIA with net impact and we'll let you know about that. And we have career advising. So I and Cecil's executive director are serial social entrepreneurs. We have faculty 20 plus, would you raise your hands here? I see you, come on. <laughs> 
that teach on things and know about things in the world because they're, they're professional faculty, right? So they're out there working on these issues at the same time that they're teaching you. Things like climate tech and global health and food and education and economic development. So whatever is stirred up in you from hearing about Blake doesn't need to stop here. There are many more resources at Berkeley and at Haas available to you, depending on your interests. And I just want to make sure you know where you come to start the journey. So there are people here to help you with your curiosity, with your thinking, with your next adventure, no matter what that will be. But now we still have some more questions for Blake. So Blake, back to you. Ready? Sure. All right. I, you may not be ready for this one, but we'll try. Oh, right. no. Have you paid your sister 500,000 plus interest? <laughs> so how many people know this clothing brand called Aviator Nation? Raise your hand. Enough. Okay. So my sister started this company, and uh, I think Forbes last said that she's a billionaire now. So I think she's doing fine. <laughs> Maybe she should pay you back. No, I'm kidding. All right. All right. So here's the next question. Tom's was a pioneering business model, and I think received disproportionate scrutiny and criticism. How did you navigate it, and what would you have done differently in hindsight? Mm, yeah, I mean, that was a really hard thing for me because you hear this, you hear this uh, adage that, you know, the media loves to build you up so then they can kind of tear you down. And, you know, we got a lot of flack for, you know, how we were, what impact were we having on communities by just going out and offering a handout. And that was really hard because all we were trying to do is do good. I mean, I was in Argentina, saw kids that didn't have shoes, wanted to give them shoes. Like, I didn't come with, like, a public health background or, you know, or, you know, and so we really at first were, like, you know, angry and frustrated and scared by this. Uh, and then we decided we had to lean into it. And so ultimately what we did was we hired some people who did have that background, who really understood the impact of, you know, giving free goods in these communities, how it impact the local community. Um, and that really led us to doing um, some local manufacturing. So we did a manufacturing plant in Haiti after, you know, the earthquake, uh, which was really successful. We moved manufacturing also to Ethiopia, um, which, you know, created a lot of jobs in Ethiopia. And then the other thing we did is we realized that just giving shoes was not enough, that we had to be part of uh, health programs as well. And so there's a lot of health programs for um, worms that kids get in Central and South America. And so they want them to come in and take the medicine that would keep them from getting worms. But the incentive, a lot of kids wouldn't come do it. They start saying, if you come, you get a free pair of shoes. And so that was a big incentive. We worked with the Gates Foundation on that. Um, and so, yeah, so we just had to get smarter and better and more sophisticated in how we did our giving. Great, thanks. So how have your previous ventures, you mentioned four or five before Tom's, right? Um, allowed you to be successful as an entrepreneur? What did you bring forward from those? I mean, just lots of learning. You know, a couple of them were moderately successful and a couple of them were huge disasters. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, one disaster was after I was on, it was not a disaster, but it, it was a failed business, I guess, um, is after I was on The Amazing Race, um, I recognized that there was this tremendous amount of interest in reality stars and their 15 minutes of fame, um, but there wasn't really a market for um, really kind of capitalizing on that. And so um, I decided to start at, I think at the age of 25, uh, I was very naive, I decided to start a television network. And it was an all-reality cable channel in which I went around and bought the rerun rights of reality shows because once you kind of knew who won, they really had no interest at the networks. But what I realized is people cared so much about the reality stars that you could pair the stars with the shows and they could kind of almost do like these shows where they gave commentary about what they were thinking when they did that move on Survivor or how they got that person outed on Big Brother or something like that. And so we were able to get the content for basically next to nothing. We knew that advertisers really want to reach this audience. It was mainly an 18 to 34 audience, which was the key audience that advertisers wanted to reach. All these components showed that we were going to have incredible success in this business. Um, the one thing we did not think about, um, which was the most important and the reason it failed, was there were only about 10 cable operators in our country at that time, um, and including DirecTV satellite provider. And so the cable operators and then DirecTV basically had a monopoly as to what content we see. It's not like today where you can see it on Hulu or you can see it on you know a number of different streaming networks, um, obviously YouTube being one of the dominant players. Um, 
So we basically had an amazing product. Um, people wanted it, and we had advertisers willing to pay for it. But our only way we were going to get anyone to ever see it was through these cable operators. And they had no need for another network. I mean, they had 400 channels already. What, what, getting one more was not going to have anyone all of a sudden decide to pay for cable television. They're paying for cable television for many other reasons already. And so they basically said, no, we, you know, we're not interested. And so we... Ended up going out of business. It was incredibly painful. I had to, I had to lay off like 40 people. Um, you know, it was, it was a really challenging, challenging situation. Um, and what I learned from that was, is I never wanted to be in a business again where so few people had the power to make it work or not work. And so when I started Tom's, the great thing was, is there's thousands of you know, stores in America that sell shoes. And, and so that was, you know, I didn't have to go out and, you know, get this one big fish customer. I could go and focus on one after another, after another, after another. And so that was one of the real lessons that I learned from a per, an earlier business that, you know, failed that really helped me as I thought about Tom's. Great. Thank you. So the buy one, give one model used by Tom's has long standing been a point of celebration. However, there have been shortcomings and challenges and all of that. Here's the big question. Is it truly possible to be a business for good? And how should incoming business leaders incorporate, I'll read it as it says, corporate philanthropy into their company brands? Absolutely. Hello? We're trying to broadcast. So hold on. <laughs> Hello? Great. Um, I don't know how to juggle. I would love to learn, though. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of examples of businesses for good out there now, um, Tom's being one of them. Um, I think the key is to really focus on, you know, kind of three things. And you hear this a lot of time in conscious capitalism, the three Ps, you know, people, planet, and the profit. Um, you know, by doing that, you can really build a business where all those stakeholders are equally um, benefiting. Um, I think the, the, I will say the bad news in all this is, is that, and because of the success of Tom's and other companies like Tom's, it's not as novel to be a business for good as it was when we started. When we started, there was nothing like this. I mean, there was Ben and Jerry's that had been giving, you know, there was the body shop that had been giving a neat erotic, but neither of them built their whole business on it like we did with Tom's. And so we really kind of pioneered this and several other businesses as well. But now today, if you were starting a business, I was talking to an entrepreneur the other day, and they were saying, okay, well, we're going to incorporate this giving model, helping people get clean water, et cetera, and, and they're going to invest a lot of money in that. And I said to them, and they thought it was weird coming in for me, I said, I don't think you should do that. I was like, I don't think there's going to be enough return on your social investment to make it work, like I talked about from a marketing perspective, because so many other companies are already doing it. So I think now what I would say for entrepreneurs that really want to do good in business is it's really important to incorporate it into the business model itself. So it can't, it, it, to do it as an add-on or to a, if you do this, we give this, I think can be, can be more difficult. But if, the, but if the actual business itself, and that's why I use the example of green energy, if the business itself is making the planet a more sustainable place, then it is a business that's doing good, but it's also not necessarily having to carve out a percentage of its margin to do so. Okay, and the, um, the final question from the group is, um, you talk a lot about conscious capitalism and for-profit business, and in your book, you also herald or celebrate nonprofits and philanthropists, and many people draw divisions between those, but you don't. Can you talk a little bit about why you don't or how you see that? Well, what I tried to do when I wrote this book, which is a long time ago now, um, as I'm thinking about it, and I'm trying to remember some of the things that I said. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I tried to, to really uh, highlight, you know, two different organizations. Businesses that were innovative in their giving and doing good, like Tom's. But then also some of these new nonprofits that were being created that were operating more like businesses. And so I'll use Charity Water as a great example. How many people know Charity Water? Raise your hand. 
Oh, wow. Okay. You should definitely check out Charity Water. Not a lot of people here know. But they've been incredibly innovative. My friend Scott Harrison started it the same year I started Tom's. And his idea was to bring water to as many people in the world that need it as possible. And if you look at the marketing of Charity Water, it's as, it's as innovative and as slick as any new you know, Silicon Valley backed tech startup. I mean, the branding is unbelievable. The storytelling is unbelievable. Um, it competes with any business in terms of marketing, um, but it's a nonprofit. Uh, they also do really, really innovative marketing campaigns like asking people, especially young, you know, young people, people who are 15, 16, 17 years old, to give up their birthday in order to raise money for, um, for Wells. And they found this to be incredibly successful, um, especially with social media, because they can message out to all their friends, like, this year, instead of having a party or bringing a present, I'm asking you to donate $10, you know, for every year I've been born or whatever. Uh, and they've raised, you know, I mean, literally, they've raised, I think, $300 million in the last couple of years through these campaigns. Um, so I also try to talk about, like, something like that in the book as well, because I think at the end of the day, there's a lot of big problems in the world that we want to solve. And sometimes the right vehicle is a nonprofit, and some, like in the psychedelic space, for instance. Um, and then sometimes it is a for-profit, like Tom's. And so I don't really see a distinction between either um, as long as the organization is being used to address a major problem in the world. Great. Thank you, Blake. We're hitting our time, and I'm going to take a little editorial freedom and go off script here. Um, Alan Ross, would you come up here? Alan does not know I was calling him up here, so bear with us. Alan is doing something I think is very innovative as a philanthropist, and he sent out an email just yesterday asking us to vote. So, Alan, I want to relinquish the final two minutes to you to make a pitch to the group. Well, thank you so much. Sure. That's very sweet. Very surprising. Um, <laughs> hi. Um, I started something a couple of years ago called the Chris Kindness Award, and everyone calls me Chris. I'm Alan. Um, I named it after my kid's preschool teacher who died, uh, just the sweetest guy I ever met. And I give $1,000 every month to someone in Berkeley who does a kind act, random acts of kindness. We've had a gas station attendant, someone who volunteers, children's hospital, a teacher. Uh, this month was a 16-year-old at Berkeley High who's from Afghanistan, just arrived in America a year ago, who helps newcoming uh, kids from all over the world acclimate to Berkeley High. Sweet, sweet stories. And we just announced our three finalists for this month um, on Monday, one of whom is a Haas person, former student of mine of 20 years ago, Olive Davis. Anyone know Olive? <laughs> Wonderful woman who uh, was with Ye for a while, young entrepreneurs at Haas, and now she started B-Bay several years ago giving back to the community, bringing in youngsters from middle school to Haas to educate them about business, to get them interested so they'll go on to college and all. Wonderful person. Anyone can vote. ChrisKindnessAward.org. Um, voting goes through Friday. If you want to vote for all of that would be wonderful. And we need nominations. We're seeking nominations all the time. Go on our website, nominate anyone who lives, works, or goes to school in Berkeley. And we've, we're raising money now. We now give second and third prize, cash prizes also. And we're trying to grow throughout the community and beyond Berkeley as well. So ChrisKindnessAward.org. Thank you so much, Nora. Thank you, Dean. Appreciate it. So we know that many of you are doing meaningful and interesting things for your local communities, for your friends, for your family. We want to thank you for all of that, for Blake, Yvonne, um, Eli, Anne, thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. We hope you were inspired to go out and try something really meaningful to you that you're passionate about in the world, and Haas is here to help you. Thank you very much.